Hey everybody, welcome to Blue Ridge Online. My name's Todd Foster, I'm one of the pastors here. So glad that you decided to join us for the service. I know that our world is still turned upside down, so we wanna take a few minutes before we jump in and listen to a talk, just bring all that's happening. We don't wanna leave it out. I want you to bring the things that are happening in your life and let's sit them at God's feet and learn from him and listen. So we're gonna join the team at the loft in Bedford and just have them lead us through a moment where we invite God's kingdom to come here as it is in heaven. Atmosphere is changing now for the spirit of the Lord is he the evidence is all around that the spirit of the Lord is he the atmosphere is changing Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around that the Spirit of the Lord is here. Overflow in this place, fill our hearts with you. Surrounded 
Heavenly Father, thank you for your presence. If we stop and listen, the evidence is all around that you're here and you're close to us and you care. So as, as we gather together online today, would you meet each of us right where we are? Lead us, teach us, help us to be more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. So there's a couple other ways that we can worship together. We can do that through giving. You can do a text to give online. You can mail a check into our new London campus. Also, we have virtual communities where we can gather together. You and I both know that we need that more than ever. There's still groups available and places to connect. So speaking of connection and community, we know that there's still a lot of quarantine to happen and we want families to feel connected, parents to have a way to bring your kids around the table. So Be Our Kids is still offering activity packets that have a daily devotional, they have activities that you can do together. So you can still pick those up at the New London campus after each in-person service, 8.30, 10.30, 12.30, and then also from 2 to 3.30 on Sundays. At the Bedford campus, Westgate Shopping Center, you can come between 11 and 12 and pick those activity packets up. Stick together as families, okay? So as a family at Blue Ridge, we're all trying to figure out how and when to open things up. I think all of us would agree, we would love it if just everything would start again, but we know we can't do that. So we've been real prayerful about where to begin. So we're excited to let you know that CR is back Sundays, 4.30 to 5.30. This week, we're kicking off with a live story, a couple details that you need to know. There won't be any kids programs yet. Also, no small groups, just large group. So we're excited to see what God does as we continue to open up. All right, this Sunday, we decided to take a step back from what we've regularly been doing and take a few moments and acknowledge the things that are happening in our society today and how we engage with them. So we're gonna join Jeremy in the studio. So today, I wanna ask your permission to talk about something that will most likely make you uncomfortable. I wanna ask your permission to talk about something that will most likely get messy and has a lot of room for misunderstanding. Now, I know I can't see you right now. And I know some of us won't be willing to go where I'm asking us to go. Some, I'm guessing, will leave Blue Ridge because of this. Some will say it's Blue Ridge getting too political. <laughs> While others might say <laughs> it isn't enough, it doesn't go far enough, or it's about time. Some will question, maybe not out loud, why do we have to talk about this? Why do we have to talk about this here? And why can't we wait for this all to just blow over and go back to life as normal? But even given all that, and maybe partly because all of that, the elders talked and prayed and felt like it was important for us to begin a conversation as a church about racism. Now, I know immediately when I say a word like that, it's polarizing. And as a speaker, that's usually the last thing you wanna do with your audience because polarization creates camps of thought. And as soon as you do that, the camps are just looking to defend what they already think and believe, to affirm their own worldview while attacking someone else's that differs. But I truly do believe because of the gospel, the good news of Jesus, that he came, died, and was resurrected, that the church should and can be different. That those of us who are followers of Jesus because of his spirit inside of us should be able to have conversations, uncomfortable conversations, conversations that would normally divide that we should be able to model something different for the world. In fact, two months ago, after the George Floyd murder, 
After processing that for a couple of days and feeling the weight of it, I posted something on my own Instagram account and Blue Ridge reposted it to their social media. I want you to listen to that now. Hey guys, I wanna talk about something today that's probably gonna make a lot of us uncomfortable. I wanna have a discussion about systemic racism in our country. I wanna talk about white privilege. I wanna be a voice that helps us as the church in the season navigate the season in a way that ushers in the kingdom of God. I want to be able to give advice, but I can't. I can't because I'm ignorant to a lot of it. You see, as I've been reading how people are acting, as I've been searching for ways in which I can be a voice that doesn't just add to the noise and division, as I've watched tragic videos that we've all seen, videos where we see the lives being taken of people like Maude Aubrey and George Floyd. As I've looked for ways to join in the discussion, as I'm wrestling with God about what I'm supposed to do and how we are supposed to respond, I find myself paralyzed. And honestly, I'm sure part of the paralyzation is probably fear, fear of saying the wrong thing, fear of adding fuel to the fire. But at the underlying foundation of it all, I'm realizing is my ignorance. But here's the great thing about ignorance. When we become aware of our ignorance, like the last few days and weeks have done for me, Ignorance then becomes a choice. It becomes a choice. And while I don't have enough today to add in any, while I don't know enough today to add in any meaningful way to the conversation being had, here's what I'm choosing. I'm choosing to educate myself on racism. I'm choosing to get, I'm choosing to allow myself to be uncomfortable and allow my worldviews to be challenged. I'm choosing to open myself up to conversations that will help expand both how personally and corporately as the church, we can be a part of the solution and not the problem. See, when I look at the life of Jesus, I see a man who dealt with racism and bigotry sexism head on in a deeply divided culture. So I have a choice. I can choose to remain ignorant because in the normal day of my life and my family's life, I don't see the obvious impact of racism on us. Or I can choose to do what Jesus simply and profoundly invited his followers to do, and that is love my neighbor as I love myself. And practically speaking today, that starts with me admitting I've been ignorant for far too long. So I don't know where this journey takes me. I don't know how long it's gonna take I'm asking for your grace, your patience, as I wade into the mess and it starts to reveal brokenness in me. I'm inviting you to join with me. Love you all, miss you all. So over the last couple of months, that's exactly what I've been doing. Making the intentional choice to combat my own ignorance. I've been doing things like reading books and articles, watching videos. I've gone to several events where this has been the focus. I've been having open, ongoing conversations with black friends and acquaintances, listening to their stories and their experiences. I've been searching scripture, asking the question that's one of our press value questions. What does God have to say about all of this? 
I've been praying with leaders here at Blue Ridge about what our response is supposed to be in this moment in time. So let me give you a disclaimer here. I am far from having arrived. But as a teacher and leader here at Blue Ridge, often my journey is the journey that God is leveraging for us as a whole. And as a largely white church, I believe there is a response that God wants and desires from us here in this specific season. So would you risk something with me right now? And I got this from a pastor out in a church in San Diego called The Rock Church. And on the screen right now, you're seeing pictures of all sorts of different people, ethnicities, races. And these different people represent all the different races from across the world. Look at the picture. Which one gets under your skin? Which one do you have a problem with? Now, I'm not going to ask you to say anything out loud, but which group bothers you? It's okay to be honest with yourself. Maybe let me help you. Maybe you look at white people and you think they don't have a clue with all their privilege. Or maybe it's Hispanics and you've thought, it seems like they're all moving here illegally and making our country an unsafe place. Maybe you visited a country and you had a horrible experience there with the people. So you said that you would never go back. Maybe it's black people and you think they're taking advantage of the system or right now playing the role of the victim. Which group or people, if you're honest with yourself, do you have the biggest issue with? Take a moment. Now throughout the rest of this talk, keep them in mind. So today I wanna to ask two questions. Why is it important for the church to engage with the subject of racism? And two, how do we go about doing it? So obviously there is a whole host of landmines here and I will unintentionally step on some of them. But what I'm asking is if you're a follower of Jesus, I'm asking for your grace, your patience, and your openness as we walk this tough road together. So would you pray with me? Jesus, I come to you right now in this moment and I am asking for you to lower our pride, lower the way that we view the world, that you would, if we're, if we're in one of those extreme camps, would you bring us more towards the middle? It's in the middle that we often find next steps and solutions. And would through the power of your spirit inside of us, Help us respond the way that you, Jesus, would have responded if you were us living today. It's in your name I pray, amen. So today, we're gonna read through an entire book of the Bible. The good news for you is it only has one chapter. So if you have a Bible or the Bible app, would you open up to the book of Philemon? Now, this really isn't a book that's a bad label. It's really a letter. A letter from a man named Paul, an early missionary and follower of Jesus, who at this point in his life is under house arrest in Rome. And he's written this letter to a man named Philemon, who lives in the city of Colossae, is wealthy, and is a slave owner. And the main subject of this letter is about another man named Onesimus, who had previously been a slave of Philemon's, but had fled, had escaped. Now, let me say this again. Even this passage I chose is full of landmines. But one of the reasons I love the Bible is it doesn't avoid the uncomfortable, messy parts of human brokenness. I want you to know, as we work our way through this chapter, I am in no way justifying or making light of the subjugation of a person or a people group. But I chose this letter because it deals with two people in Philemon and Onesimus who are on two sides of the extreme when it comes to this issue. And we're gonna watch as God asks them 
both to do something in light of the gospel that I believe models for us what our response can be and why it's important. So let's start reading all 25 verses in Philemon, in the book of Philemon. So Philemon chapter one, verse one, it says this, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker. Now, let's stop there. Wait, Jeremy. Paul is calling this slave owner a dear friend. That feels uncomfortable. I would agree. It does. But hold on as we continue reading. Verse two. Also to Epiphia, our sister, and Archidipus, our fellow soldier, and a church that meets in your home, grace and peace to you, Philemon, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear, Philemon, about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Verse seven, for your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, Philemon, you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. So what's interesting here to me is we see that not only was Philemon a wealthy slave owner in the first century, but at some point he had come into a relationship with Christ through Paul's message about the resurrection. And now as a follower of Jesus, a disciple of his, Philemon is using his house to host the church in Colossae, or at least a portion of the church, so they can come and gather corporately to learn about and to worship God. And Paul is sincerely complimenting the work of God he has seen through Philemon and his love for God's people, his love for other followers of Jesus. But Paul continues, Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. Paul is saying that because you are a follower of Jesus, Philemon, as am I, as Paul's speaking, I could just tell you what you ought to do and you would be obligated to do it. But I would rather not order it. But I would rather allow the love of God you've experienced through the power of the gospel lead you to the correct response. So what is it that Paul wants Philemon to do? Well, let's continue in the second part of verse nine. It says, it is as none other than Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful to both you and to me. Now this is such a God thing to do. First, you have Philemon, this first century wealthy slave owner who's come into a saving relationship with Christ through Paul's missionary journey. And now, after Paul has been arrested and is awaiting his trial, God brings an escaped slave of Philemon's to Paul's literal doorstep. And Paul shares the hope of Jesus with Onesimus, and he comes into a relationship with Christ. Now, can you just imagine for a moment when Onesimus and Paul connect the dots? And the moment that Philemon is first reading this letter. But before he moves on, Paul also points out something. Paul states, starts to address an issue that Philemon has with Onesimus. It's not just that he escaped and fled, but somehow he had wronged Philemon. And as we'll see in a bit, it's either he stole some money or property or something like that. But look at what Paul says next. It's shocking. Verse 12. I am sending him, Onesimus, who is my very heart, back to you. Did you get that? 
I am sending him back to you. This escaped slave who wronged you, Philemon, but let's be honest, who you've also wronged, I'm sending him back to you. (laughs) What's Paul doing? Well, let's keep reading. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you would do would not seem forced, but be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was so that you might have him back forever. Notice Paul's very specific words. Listen to how he might have him back. No longer, verse 16, as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. You see, Paul is asking in light of the gospel, the fact that Jesus came and died and was resurrected in light of the kingdom of God that has taken up residence inside of both Philemon and Onesimus. Paul is sending back Onesimus to make things right. But get this, not as a slave, but as a brother in Christ. And he expects Philemon to treat Onesimus this way. See, Paul is in no way justifying the subjugation of another human being. In fact, in his very words to Philemon, as he talks about Onesimus as a fellow man and a brother, he was actually elevating how he wants Philemon to view Onesimus. Paul continues, verse 17, So if you consider me a partner, Philemon, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done to you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing with this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do not wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. One more thing, prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you in spirit. So what is Paul doing here? What was his purpose and how does it answer the questions we asked in the beginning? Why is it important for the church to engage with the subject of racism? And two, how should we go about it? Well, as Eric Mason, a pastor and author in Philadelphia points out, just imagine this with me for a moment. Imagine who's in Philemon's circle. I mean, he's a wealthy slave owner in the city of Colossae. Who do you imagine are his friends, the people in his circle? They'd be other wealthy, powerful, influential people in the city of Colossae, right? Now imagine as they hear that this escaped slave who had wronged his owner has come back. And Philemon, rather than punish Rather than seek repayment, rather than enslave him once again, what does he do? Well, he doesn't just take him back. He doesn't just forgive his debts. He raises his status to that of an equal, to that of a brother. Imagine as those other rich, wealthy slave owners and friends ask, what on earth, Philemon, are you doing? Why aren't you punishing him? And Philemon says, it's because of the God I serve. He's changed me. Imagine as those friends ask, wait, 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 wait. (laughs) It's because of the God you serve. Tell me about this God. Imagine that moment as Philemon shares the message of Jesus with his friends. But it's not just Philemon's response. Think about Onesimus coming back. Who would be in his circle? The exact opposite group, correct? Other slaves, the poor, people from the other sides of the track. 
And they hear that Onesimus, this escaped slave, is back. And they ask Onesimus, why did you come back? You were hundreds of miles away. You were free. And after you stole something? And Onesimus' response, well, you won't believe this. But as I came to Rome, yes, I was, I was hiding, but I was free. And somehow I was brought to the doorsteps of a man named Paul, where he shared with me this message about another kingdom that comes through this person, Jesus, and his resurrection. And now I follow this new God and his kingdom way of living. And this is how he wants me to respond. Can you imagine the questions and the conversations that all of this would usher in? You see, both men had been transformed by Jesus, but both men no longer now served the kingdom of this world, but served a different kingdom, served the kingdom of God, and that required a new response from both of them. You see, the beauty of both responses is that it modeled for a broken world a new kingdom. Both of their responses ushered in a bit more of the kingdom of God into the spaces God had given them influence in. Now, here's the deal. Did their responses solve the issue of injustice, racism, and subjugation of people? No. That was 2,000 years ago, and all of that is still happening today worldwide. But what did it do? It modeled for people around them a different way, a new way, a new radical message that made room for the kingdom of God to come into their space a little more. So why do we need to talk about the issues of racism in the church and outside in this world? Because there is a broken, sin-filled world. And they're in desperate need to see a group of people model something different. We claim to have the power of his spirit inside of us. Well, if that's true, we have an opportunity in this moment to model like Philemon and Onesimus something completely different, something otherworldly, something that will catch others off guard, something that could look so different from the chaos out there. And when the world asks why, why is it you can all can talk about these things? You can engage with others who look different than you. How is it you can hear different thoughts and have your worldviews challenged and rather than demonize one another, you treat that other person as a brother and a sister? When they ask those questions, we get the opportunity to point towards the hope of the gospel inside of us. But how do we do this? Well, interestingly, Remember, Philemon lived in the city of Colossae and hosted the church in his house. Well, in another letter that Paul wrote to the entire church in Colossae, which would have been something that both Philemon and Onesimus would have heard and read in their gatherings, Paul wrote this in Colossians 4, 5, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. See, when hard things come up, the world, and let's be honest, the church, often want to approach our conversations, our social media posts, full of salt, right? Trying to make our voices heard. We want everyone to know why we're right and why they're wrong. We see that all over the place right now. But God is asking that our conversations not be full of salt, but be full of grace sprinkled with salt, meaning full of humility. Think about how much humility was required for Philemon to treat Onesimus with grace when he returned. Think about how much humility it took for Onesimus to return. But think about how loudly it spoke to the powerful work of God in both of them. Think about the people's eternities who were changed because these two guys responded to this radical call by Jesus. So what does all of this mean for us? What if the next time you hear someone at work, someone in your family, 
someone on social media, post something, share a pain they feel in this season, share something about all of this division that differs from your view, that rather than debate, rather than ignore, rather than remain silent, rather than search the internet for someone that agrees with you, that then you can repost as a rebuttal, what if you took one simple but often scary step? What if you emailed that person? What if you called that person that Jesus loves? What if you texted that person that Jesus died for? What if you private messaged that person that God loved enough to send his only son? And what if you said to them, can we go to lunch? Can we go get some coffee? And you humbly said, I would love to hear more about what's going on inside of you. I would love to hear more of your story. I wonder if we started with the simple response like that. How would we watch God move and impact our sphere that he's given us influence over by bringing a little bit more of his kingdom here to earth as it is on heaven?
So thanks for joining us today for the service. God is a way maker. He can do exceedingly abundantly more than we could ask or imagine. So what's your next step in God's kingdom coming during this season and time?